before that, Ananda, please make uh, Arun sir the co host. I think uh, yes. that he'll be Keep doing it, sir. Doing it. Okay, okay. Sir, uh, he can be made presenter after introduction. Yeah, yes. So, uh... yeah, can you make a presenter so that I can present? Uh, sir, actually, uh, maybe yeah, within it, a minute or, uh, yeah, it, it's all right. Yeah, yeah, I'm doing it. <coughs> yes, sir, you are now the presenter. Can you see my screen now? Yeah, your desktop is visible. Yeah, the presentation is starting to appear. Okay. Yeah, it is visible now. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, Ananda, are we ready to start? Should we wait because uh, no, so sir, we will start. Okay. Okay, 57, 58, uh, should we wait for uh, some more people to join or shall we straight away start? We will start, sir. We will, we will start. start. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. Okay, so, uh, so welcome uh, back to the second day of the FDP. Uh, today, to start with, we have uh, the session handled by Professor uh, Arun Kumar from IIT Delhi. And he will be speaking on risk assessment of emerging contaminants. I request the uh, participants to mute their audio. Uh, some disturbances are coming. So I request uh, the participants to please mute the audio. Uh, okay. Sir, I'm muting all. Maybe you can unmute. Uh, uh, no, but. Sir, you can unmute and you can yeah, speak. No? Yeah, 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 yes, yes, yes. Okay. So uh, now I invite. Uh, Jawahar Saud to introduce the speaker for the day. Jawahar, please. Good morning, all. Uh, sir, am I audible? Yeah, yes. yes, Jawhar, yes. Please. Good morning, all. Welcome to the second day of uh, uh, Atal FDP on Emerging Technologies for Sustainable Environmental Management, organized by Department of Civil Engineering, NIT Calicut. Uh, we have with us uh, for our uh, first session of day two, uh, Dr. Arun Kumar, sir, uh, uh, who is currently professor at Department of Civil Engineering, IIT Delhi. Uh, Arun Kumar, sir, completed his B.Tech in Civil Engineering from IIT Kanpur and his M.Tech uh, in Environmental Engineering from IIT Kanpur. Uh, he completed uh, his PhD uh, with focus area of emerging pollutant health risk assessment and uh, environmental decision making from Drexel University, Philadelphia, US. Uh, he has uh, over 15 years of research and academic experience uh, with a reputed international publication, uh, international journal publications and uh, contributions to international and national conferences. Uh, he is a well-known uh, figure uh, in the area of uh, uh, risk management. He has over, uh, he has sponsored research projects valued at over uh, 1 crore 31,000 and he is a member of uh, Society of Risk Analysis and uh, American Water Works Association. Uh, his core research interest uh, is risk assessment on emerging contaminants uh, with other research areas of interest is water reuse, emerging water contaminants, risk assessment, water treatment, environmental statistics and quantitative decision making. I cordially welcome you to uh, welcome you, sir, to the session. Thank you very thank much. You, uh, yeah. Thank you very much. A very good uh, good morning to uh, everybody. Uh, it's a very uh, nice thing that uh, you invited uh, invited me, and I think I'm very thankful to NIT Calicut for hosting uh, our uh, basically one month stay in uh, their campus last time. So it's very uh, nice association. Uh, so uh, we will start uh, with our uh, today's lecture. 
and uh, the the topic is risk assessment of emerging contaminants and so this we started in 2010 when i uh, joined it delhi and uh, it's been basically very good uh, journey uh, with respect to this topic and uh, thanks to all the students and then later on when uh, phd students mtech students and btechs and then uh, post docs and then all the collaborators with whom uh, i'm fortunate to work and i'm also thanking uh, thankful to uh, professor vargesi to uh, inviting us uh, so uh, these are the people like we have been working and i think there are many more uh, people behind it but i don't they have their photographs so that's why they are not here uh, so generally what we do is uh, we do a teach risk assessment as johar has mentioned and uh, we try to put uh, on the website so this is like a open access i mean open uh, so anybody can go to the website and whatever material uh, uh, is uploaded there you can go and uh, see them so today what we will do is uh, we will focus on the uh, nanotechnology related uh, pollution when obviously the same uh, approach can be used for uh, other types of pollutants for example antibiotics also uh, pharmaceutical compounds and then uh, your uh, personal care products you can apply the similar structure uh, for pathogens uh, let's say viruses so we will uh, talk about basically the risk assessment framework uh, we will talk about uh, emerging contaminant and uh, why to focus on emerging contaminants what about previous uh, contaminants i mean the, the existing contaminants uh, what is uh, so different uh, about uh, emerging contaminants versus your conventional contaminants so these are the things like we will try to uh, see and uh, how to get the uh, toxicity information or where to get the toxicity information uh, how to use that those information uh, to estimate the risk and to see whether something is problematic or not uh, what to do if you uh, come to know that okay there is a risk so these are the things like we will try to discuss and uh, what i will be doing is basically i will be stopping uh, in between and giving you some 5 minute to 10 minutes uh, to note down your thoughts and uh, write down your answers or basically steps so the idea is in this 2 uh, hour session uh, you should be able to basically develop something so it's it will be nice that if you open your word file or your copy and then you can keep answering so that later on it can become a small uh, project uh, for you and then uh, later on you can develop it and uh, while the lecture is going on uh, you can keep thinking that how uh, you are going to develop the problem so that's how basically uh, you will get a good experience in terms of uh, i mean running going through the example uh, for different sections of this uh, risk assessment uh, framework uh, so nanotechnology related pollution uh, obviously these now this is like too much uh, uh, studied uh, Content now, many people know about uh, nanoparticles, basically the small size dummy particles, which where we have a dimension less than 100 nanometers, and uh, they have been used in different uh, products uh, because they provide basically high specific surface area. You can have so much activity there, uh, and then uh, it can be generated in the lab. It can be basically found in the nature natural environment, and so whatever we generate in the lab, uh, whether once we use them. Uh, if they are coming in your wastewater or in your air or in your food items or soil whether those things are problematic or not so those are the things like we need to uh, worry about so obviously in the nanoparticle category you can have uh, uh, metal based uh, nanoparticles you can have carbon based nanoparticles and uh, as everybody know that for metal uh, we can measure basically in terms of the ions uh, metal content and with respect to carbon you can measure it with respect to uh, cod chemical oxygen demand biochemical oxygen demand uh, total organic carbon sometimes you can measure specific compounds also so now are these nanoparticles let's say for example silver nanoparticle or your uh, carbon nanotubes or uh, titanium oxide nanoparticles copper oxide nanoparticles or fullerene so obviously uh, with respect to measurement you can measure in terms of the metal content you can measure in terms of the carbon content or in terms of your um, basically cod uh, but then we have to uh, also keep uh, one thing in mind that we have to know uh, what is the size because uh, the size uh, affects your toxicity uh, if the particle is very small it can enter into your skin or your body and it can have different effect if the particle is large so that is why uh, it's important and uh, as i mentioned with respect to simple uh, application i mean simple uh, monitoring method people can measure metal carbon content uh, as long as you have done the proper size fractionation and then you can represent in terms of uh, that size fractionation okay with respect to um, let's say uh, 
100, 1 nanometer to 1 micron range or 1 nanometer to 100 nanometer range. Uh, this is the size and this is the mass concentration. This is your uh, total content, total carbon content, total metal content and all those things. So that those things can still suffice uh, with respect to regulatory purpose uh, because obviously uh, not everybody can uh, use all the instruments to uh, understand or to detect, to characterize uh, these nanoparticles. So there is a need for basically uh, representing these nanoparticles in terms of the parameters which everybody can use it. So now this is your first activity. Um, I'm sure uh, you can relate uh, with this type of things. Uh, every day we use so many products um, or you uh, obviously for our personal uh, care uh, or let's say for our houses or for your uh, car or for your uh, garden or in your wastewater treatment plant or um, in your uh, any chemical industry. So whatever nanoparticles we use and uh, whether what is the chance that they can come in our water, uh, they can come in the air. Uh, what will be the composition you can uh, expect and uh, what is the composition uh, or what is the concentration we, we will be like releasing uh, in the environment and uh, what happens to the environment. So these are the things uh, one can have in mind uh, when people start uh, entering about the nanoparticle and uh, understanding about the nanoparticle. So you can take five minutes just to note down very simple thoughts. Later on you can fill it also that uh, what are the nanoparticles you can remember all your products which you, where you suspect that you, you might be having some nanoparticles and which you apply for uh, daily morning activity or let's say in your food item and uh, you can make a list later on you can check it you can modify again and uh, in that way okay so let's take five minutes and uh, then we can uh, go through uh, some of the list and then we will go to the next person so please take five minutes
okay so uh, del, can anybody tell uh, what what are the things uh, you have in your list anybody uh, uh, can i start arun just yeah please please yeah uh, so uh, what i wrote down is uh, the nanoparticles in deodorants uh, because what i understand is they add uh, silver nanoparticles etc for uh, as a antimicrobial uh, agent uh, and then maybe for uh, breaking down of some of the compounds so when you apply it uh, maybe chances of contaminating water is less but then uh, indoor air uh, will be contaminated severely so uh, yeah, that yeah. is what i wrote down no no sure sure yeah okay um, anybody else hello so i think yeah, uh, sir so, so various household wares like cosmetics uh, sunscreens deodorants air purifier fabrics uh, stain removers and paints so these are the basically ingredients we are using uh, as a nanoparticles okay very good okay anybody else yeah sir uh, Hello, sir. Can you hear me? Yeah, I'm, please. Yeah. yeah, sir. We are using in uh, food packaging actually, active packaging, silver nanoparticles. We are using, and then uh, biopolymerized nanoparticles are also using to strengthening biodegradable polymers. And we are using uh, this in the drug as a drug carrier in uh, researchers uh, are using that one. And then aquaculture ponds for feeding fish, uh, a micro encapsulated. Uh, feeding i mean nutrients are using then for treating polluted water we are using uh, nanoparticle and then uh, there are n numbers these are the few okay good okay anybody else sir we have uh, written a review paper if you want i will upload that review paper yeah yeah sure sure, sure. okay anybody uh, else uh, uh, hello sir uh, generally ppcb products are uh, the one where micro pollutants are there like scrubbers face wash uh, it's a emerging one people are using uh, face wash which are having small particles and thinking about that the skin will be clear more but that is going into the wastewater directly okay okay good okay so actually now i got the feel that everybody knows about that part so that's good okay so uh, we will uh, go ahead and then i think uh, everybody can modify and then at the end probably you will be having uh four five activities and if you compile uh, all the activities you should be able to basically start the one uh, risk assessment for one of the uh, basically uh, contaminants or category of the product okay so uh, as everybody somebody was basically uh, trying that uh, how one uh, you, we use it and uh, whether what is the chance of basically um, these things contaminating your indoor air or in your uh, wastewater and, and then uh, when when the wastewater goes to your uh, Uh, let's say wastewater treatment plant. Uh, there, uh, depending on whatever treatment plant we have, whether we have uh, secondary wastewater treatment plant, tertiary, and uh, what is the chance of these nanoparticles being removed there? And then uh, those uh, wastewater effluent uh, sometimes they are used for uh, different uh, reuse activity. For example, irrigation activities uh, with some modif treatment, or sometimes they are discharged in the river. And the sludge, uh, these sludge basically uh, they can also Uh, dump on your uh, different. I mean, if if uh, the sludge is having a good nutrient, uh, then it can be basically dumped, or it can be used by farmers uh, as a uh, basically nutrient amendment material. And so at that time also one has to see basically what is the concentration of these things. Uh, similarly, for the animal manure or biosolid other uh, solid based uh, categories also, uh, these things can go to your soil or landfill, and from there also uh, they can contaminate basically your uh, subsurface soil and uh, later on it can contaminate your uh, ground water or surface water and then if you are drawing going to draw the water for uh, drinking purpose for treatment of uh, for treatment for producing uh, drinking water and depending on the what are the unit process again you have in your drinking water treatment plant uh, so we, then we can see basically what is the chance that uh, we will be getting those concentration in our uh, uh, drinking water and then whether we have exposure or not so these are the uh, different uh, locations or different uh, media uh, medium you can say uh, where one need to understand what is the concentration and right now this is a very general uh, schematic this you can apply for antibiotics also you can apply for viruses also and then you can see basically that uh, in what contaminant what compartment we have to focus 
and we have to see basically that what is our exposure activity from these uh, compartments. So now this is the second activity. I'm sure many people are trying to uh, relate uh, link to that uh, portion also. Then let's say once we have the air uh, polluted, then how we are going to basically um, clean it? Or let's say once you have your uh, nanoparticle, uh, which, which is or nanoparticle containing product, if that has come in your uh, wastewater, uh, how uh, that is going to interact with your environment? What can uh, happen to those nanoparticles, whether it will be degraded by your bacteria or whether it will be absorbed by your soil or whether they will be remaining persistent in the environment? And uh, if they remain persistent in the environment, what will be the pollution load now uh, because of them, let's say with respect to change in your uh, metal content, uh, metal contamination of the environment, or let's say your uh, what is the change with respect to COD? Uh, of your wastewater, what is the change with respect to beauty of the wastewater, and what is our chance of getting exposure from those things? So again, uh, please take five minutes. Just try to uh, make some uh, five or six points, uh, just to see that basically how, what are the things we should be knowing uh, to answer this question. So please take five minutes. So there are responses in the chat box also, uh, Professor Arun. If you okay. Hope you are, uh, there are many people who have resp I mean, uh, given their comments in the chat boxes. Okay, maybe I will just listen uh, from them because it will be difficult for me to see both things, and then later on I can. Yes, yes, yes. Understand it.
for those who post in the chat box they can uh, even uh, yeah yeah please yeah. Sir, please please, sir, please please okay can anybody share like what they are thinking okay so for the example which i considered uh, of deodorant uh, uh, so disposal actually that uh, gets over so uh, disposal as such may not be uh, a concern but then the products are emitted into the atmosphere uh, so uh, if it is metal anyway they are uh, going to be uh, conservative they are not going to get degraded so uh, they get absorbed somewhere or I mean the feed part I am not uh, very sure and it can definitely contaminate the environment uh, because indoor air uh, people are spending most of their time inside the house so uh, that is uh, definitely that is going to get uh, inside your body so uh, exposure is definite uh, in the case okay sure okay anybody else I think many people have written it so if somebody can describe what they have written Yes. Sir, nanoparticle, uh, uh, that depends on the type of nanoparticle, whether it is metallic or, uh, or organic, like uh, depends, for example, a cellulose nanoparticle, okay, it will be assimilated by the microbe that is present in the water or soil, whatever it is. But if it is a metallic nanoparticle, the thing is maybe different, maybe there is a chance, for example, prolonged exposure to such kind of metallo nanoparticle can can affect the biological system also. Sometimes bioaccumulation possibilities like heavy metals, we can, uh, studies are not that much done, but at least for few metal particle research output, uh, there are papers on nanotoxicity. So bioaccumulation, uh, ma biomagnification chances are there if you are exposed to prolong the use of this metallo nanoparticle especially because in the nature also it is present but uh, if if we are engineering this particle and uh, pushing into a, a ecosystem uh, then it will become a, a kind of you know uh, uh, different uh, scenario so uh, so those particles there may be accumulation problems especially bioaccumulation problems but not many studies are done but uh, there are uh, reports of bioaccumulation biomagnification for metallo particles Okay, sure, sure, sure. Okay, can anybody else like uh, who have written uh, in the chat box and if you're thinking, I mean, you can describe the way you're thinking. Okay, do you have any student here in this audience? Sir, there, but mostly it is faculty members. So, okay, sure. uh, yeah, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't tell about the constitution of the participants. Actually, we have two hundred registered participants, of which around uh, one more than one hundred and fifty is faculty. There are uh, quite a few number of research scholars, and then a few PG students. Okay. So uh, that is yeah. The sure, sure. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, does anybody else have any thought about uh, like how you would like to basically what type of answer would you like to know? Um, any thinking? Anybody else? Sir, good morning. My name is Michael Hognosh. Yes. Sir, I think that uh, clothing is also one kind of a nano. It is made up from uh, nanoparticle silica. Okay. So uh, it can contaminate the environment if uh, its uh, maximum usage will be there. Suppose uh, the textile industries that are using that uh, coating of silica on the surface of that clothing that can harm to that environment in which they are working for, for the workers. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. So basically, uh, okay. So I think if, through this activity, what we are trying to do is uh, we are trying to understand what could be the sources of nanoparticle in our uh, environment. And maybe some of the sources are coming from our, due to our activity, our da daily activity. And then later on, we will see that, okay, how uh, this information is going to be useful uh, in your uh, risk assessment activity and uh, how different answers, basically, let's say the fate and can it contaminate to in the, uh, our environment and can it affect uh, us in some way. So these are the things will be used in, in uh, setting up the uh, risk assessment uh, component. 
so at the first time at that time this information will be uh, useful so later on you will again see that when we have started let's say right now we have uh, deodorants uh, we have uh, basically some emission during manufacturing of the clothes or some personal care products and all so these are the activities and then uh, you can see whether uh, things uh, whether they are going to contain these hazardous nanoparticles or not what is the concentration uh, what is the ch uh, basically chance and the magnitude of them uh, coming in the environment and then what is our exposure possibility and then later on we will use this uh, stage wise information uh, for uh, setting up the risk assessment uh, calculation so again some more information uh, let's say these are the two locations one is obviously the treated effluent and the finished biosolids so the wastewater which is coming from your treatment plant again depending on the treatment plant uh, unit processes and, and uh, you can see basically different uh, basically fractions or different partitioning of your nanoparticles obviously some of those nanoparticles will be converted to something else uh, some of them will be basically absorbed by your bacteria some of them will still be remaining in your um, in your uh, wastewater effluent some of them will be basically settled and precipitated i mean i mean uh, as part of the sludge removal method. Uh, so those things will happen. And then you will have the treated effluent and you will have the finished biosolid. It means these are the two locations where we should be monitoring or uh, measuring your nanoparticles, obviously from the water side. And obviously in the air also, we have to take the air sample and uh, similar to particulate matter. Uh, we have to basically go for the ultrafine particles and try to see uh, what will the concentration break up and all those things. So this is very uh, short and very uh, partial uh, compilation. So many people try to measure uh, nanoparticles in wastewater. So generally what they do is they use different type of filters. And so, uh, and then uh, they go up to, let's say, um, nanometer range filters. And then uh, they try to basically find out what is the mass concentration on that, those filters and what is the metal content corresponding to those solids which are deposited. Then they do some uh, uh, basically surface characterization. They do some uh, morphology characterization using your electron microscopies. Uh, they do some uh, mineralogy characterization using your X-ray diffraction method. And then uh, they also do basically try to find out the size in your water, which is called hydrodynamic diameter. So these type of information uh, they obtain. And then once they obtain this type of information, uh, then they try to see whether they have a nanoparticle of this particular type uh, in this much uh, magnitude. And uh, so that's how basically people try to monitor in your wastewater some modified method is used for monitoring in your uh, sludge also and then that is how basically people try to know uh, what is the occurrence of these nanoparticles in our uh, wastewater or natural environment so one thing is obviously i mean we are worried about ourselves but then uh, these nanoparticles uh, can affect our uh, basically inert i mean uh, non-human environment also uh, let's say it can have a pollution of uh, water uh, it can basically imbalance your uh, water chemistry. Uh, it can basically contaminate your sediments. Uh, you can have some uh, contamination of the sediment, metal contamination. It can basically imbalance it. Uh, it can uh, toxicity to different species, fishes, your algae, uh, different species, Daphnia, uh, they can have different uh, types of uh, toxic effects. And obviously, we are somewhere linked to these uh, species. So we can also have some exposure. Uh, if you're doing, uh, if you're getting in contact with water or sediment or let's say air, and then um, we can also have a chance of uh, exposure. For example, when you're talking about the deodorants and we are talking about the, let's say, nanoparticles, uh, which are going to be basically spread in the environment so that they can do a disinfection there. If they are very small, the chance, the chances are that we can also inhale them. And, and then uh, how those are going to basically interact uh, with our respiratory system. So those things also people need to uh, get some information so that they can um, basically set up the risk assessment framework and then uh, try to calculate some numbers based on the available uh, information. So in general, I mean, with respect to India, I'm, many people are now working, many people are basically manufacturing, synthesizing nanoparticles and all those things. Now, uh, many people are starting basically with respect to understanding what will be the effect if they discharge or dispose uh, these things uh, in environment. And we need more of these type of activities so that we can have a better idea uh, what type of uh, nanoparticle we should be synthesizing or we should be producing so that it should not have a basically effect uh, on the environment. So when I started uh, in 2010, uh, many people are basically synthesizing nanoparticle. Obviously, I mean, right now also many people are synthesizing. 
but then that time nobody was basically looking at the implication side it so it was a good uh, gap area for us so we started working in uh, that side basically implication of the nanoparticles and uh, the monitoring of the nanoparticles in water environment so these are the areas which are still lacking in india uh, so many people uh, are basically now i mean look at this side also and uh, try to work so that uh, it can basically update uh, indian government and uh, so this is a very uh, open area where many people uh, need to be basically working so that we can have more idea uh, because the size is very small maybe that there is a issue in the detection methods and all for the routine uh, activity uh, so that is why basically uh, not many people are entering into in this area but it's like very important area uh, next to the ions obviously this nanoparticles uh, they can give you uh, all type of harmful effects uh so one should be basically uh, looking at these things so now uh, what we will do is basically uh, we will again going to uh, a small focus with respect to water reuse uh we have uh, obviously everybody knows about the water stress and the uh, need for basically reusing water in different uh, basically by different ways and uh, if you have this waste water and uh, effluent if you have some antibiotics which are still remaining there if you have some uh, nanoparticles which are still remaining there if you have some uh, viruses uh, some bacteria pathogens they are still there then obviously one concern come that uh, if some trace uh, concentration is there whether we will be at risk if you use for irrigation purpose or uh, if you use for any uh, human contact activities so uh, that is why basically this type of uh, interlinking and this type of uh, calculation is important to study is important that uh, during the water reuse activity uh how is this going to contaminate your environment how is this going to contaminate your uh, let's say uh, vegetables or uh, non edible crops or plants and whether it is going to contaminate your soil environment whether you will be getting exposed to this uh, nanoparticles in uh, indirect way so these type of things basically people uh, try to uh, see okay so uh, in our group uh, we were focusing on many aspects so this is a slide from one of my a uh, phd student dr dipya singh so uh, we started focusing on the sources of the emerging contaminants in the environment and then uh, what will be the concentration there uh, in your um, basically in your waste water effluent on your sludge the waste water effluent can go to uh, river surface water and there human can get exposed to because of the surface activities i mean uh, recreational activity some other activity the, the waste water can also be used for irrigation purpose and then if it is used for irrigation purpose then if it is used for irrigation purpose uh, then there is a chance the plants will be exposed to uh, the plants can uptake some of the nanoparticles some of the contaminants and uh, it can affect basically the plant growth it can affect the impact of the uh, agriculture yield if some uh, con uh, contamination is accumulated in the plant if that plant is edible plant then there is a chance of human exposure if you are uh, using a sludge and the sludge is uh, having some uh, nanoparticles or antibiotics or let's say some remaining pathogens if you are applying to the field because of the because if they have the, the sludge is having the nutrients so these nanoparticles antibiotics or pathogens they are going to expose to i mean applied uh, on your soil and uh, depending on the your uh, leaching conditions uh, these things can come and uh, impact your groundwater soil and uh, basically can have a chance of human exposure so if you have uh, whenever we have a chance of human exposure then we have to basically see that how to estimate the risk so that is where we have to we will uh, do some uh, risk calculation and then uh, we will get some number then we have to compare uh, with respect to guideline and uh, yes and then we have to compare with respect to guideline and uh, depending on the availability of the guideline we will come to know whether we have a risk or not if there is a risk then obviously it is going to give us the negative feedback and we have to do some more uh, treatment uh, in between uh, before we start uh, using this waste water effluent or sludge for uh, basically discharging to the environment or um, for your agriculture activity so this is the little bit big picture flow chart uh, to see that where are the locations where uh, human can get exposure the plants can accumulate the things it can affect the soil environment it can affect the plant growth and uh, it can affect the waste water so what we will do is let's take 5 minutes uh, just to see this diagram uh, uh, and to understand that uh, how these things are basically interconnected and then uh, we will go to the next portion so please take 5 minutes just to go through every boxes and to see how things are interrelated so please take 5 minutes uh, meanwhile uh, will you take questions in between 
Yeah, uh, please, please. Yeah, because there is a question in the chat box. I'll read it out for you. So whatever sure. questions come in the chat box, I'll read it out for you because it may not be possible for you to read. So, uh, yeah, sure. uh, so this is from Bhavi Patel. She is asking, uh, uh, are they are these nanoparticles in dissolved form or in the suspended form or in both forms? Okay. So um, see, I mean, as per the conventional definition, uh, if something is passed from your point zero point four five micron filter. Uh, then they are basically termed as uh, dissolved uh, solids. And uh, so obviously the nanoparticle will come under the dissolved solid category because um, as per the definition, uh, less than 100 nanometer should be one dimension. Uh, so, and obviously 0.45 is 450 nanometers. Uh, so they are still solids, uh, but they are, they are solids of very uh, small size and very less concentration. And, and uh, they will not be basically completely dissociated and dissolved just like your uh, NaCl sodium salt or your glucose. They will st still be in a suspension. So you can say in a collateral category, uh, they will be in the collateral category. Yeah. And I have one uh, small doubt, like uh, in yes. a treatment plant or in a, you know, in the wastewater uh, flow, uh, will it not get uh, maybe, uh, if not absorbed, then uh, somewhat uh, engulfed into the sludge material? and removed along with that yeah so basically let's say i mean if you see from the let's say primary sedimentation tank or the coagulation unit where you use uh, these uh, coagulants and if you're going for the sweep coagulation method and then uh, obviously uh, they can be trapped and they can i mean these things can be removed but then the, the concentration is very small and the you need a very long uh, contact time uh, because these are very small size particle and uh, for a small large particle this uh, sweep coagulation engulfing is easier for the small very small nanometer range uh, particles uh, maybe let's say a 200 nanometer range particles uh, you will be needing like uh, too much long contact time to have all this uh, engulfation and then uh, once your flock is heavy then you can sit down. Main uh, can, problem uh, is uh, can there be an absorption mechanism possible yeah I mean, these nanoparticles uh, uh, because they are also particle uh, yeah. obviously uh, yeah so i mean they can be absorbed on bacteria they can absorb on some um, basically let's say activated carbon because if, if you have a porous particle right? uh, so they can enter into a, uh, basically por a porous uh, structure of the um, uh, adsorbents but then again the size is very small so the fusion will be taking very long time uh, uh, so then uh, there uh, we will have a contact time problem again so, uh, have you conducted any studies on uh, nanoparticles in the air? Uh, what the, what is their, for example, the example that I was telling of silver nanoparticles. So, what is their fate in the environment once it is emitted? Okay, so I mean, first of all, I have not done it. Uh, okay. But uh, yeah, I mean, I'm sure those people who work in the air uh, air side, if they are able to measure ultrafine particles. Uh, so uh, obviously, in our lab, I'm not in in uh, IIT Delhi, uh, Professor Gazala's lab. Uh, so we had the one PhD student, Dr. Ananya Das. So she was measuring basically the um, ultrafine particles also in India at human height level. Uh, so we will have the, let's say, uh, we, it will be similar to your particulate matter, uh, but the dimension will be very uh, small uh, nanometer range. And then um, you can expect basically similar to your particulate matter, the composition, your uh, metal content, I mean metals and your the pH. So those things can uh, be there on these ultrafine particles also. And uh, uh, obviously, let's say if the, I mean, whatever we, uh, from the person care product side, obviously when we spray, so let's say if you are spraying some uh, nanoparticles in your uh, aerosol form, uh, so let's say uh, silver nanoparticle, we are taking the example or some other toxic and titanium oxide is also very um, active uh, disinfectant. So they will remain in the environment because uh, the size is very small, very, very small. So uh, their settling will be very small. And uh, obviously, if in the air, uh, if you don't have anything else, like it is going to take very long time for them to settle. And uh, depending on the uh, wind and uh, weather condition, I mean, it can go very long. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, anybody else? Any uh, question? Uh, who have yeah, questions so, can so even uh, type in the chat box. Uh, uh, just a second, Javar. Those who have doubts can even uh, type in the chat box. I will read it out. No problem. Yeah. 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 Uh, sir, do you have any standards, discharge standards till now for emerging 
Well, I mean, we don't have a standard. Uh, we don't have a stand. Yeah, we don't have a standard with respect to emerging contaminant as such. But uh, because these emerging, I mean, now see when I started, I mean, I was like uh, very much shouting that we don't have standards and all. But now after ten years, uh, I mean, I'm understanding basically how we can uh, solve the problem. Uh, so uh, let's say these nanoparticles. If you're talking about uh, metal-based nanoparticles, or if you're talking about carbon-based nanoparticles. So obviously we need to have a individual category information, just like for example, uh, pesticides. So we have some standards with respect to particular pesticides uh, type, or sometimes we do the standards with respect to chemical oxygen demand or biochemical oxygen demand, and all those things. So similarly, with respect to um, nanoparticles, if if you're talking about metal-based nanoparticles, so as long as uh, basically we are satisfying the metal limit uh, as uh, with respect to CPCV or with respect, obviously right now. Uh, we will talk about the cpcb guidelines so with respect to cpcb uh, then this is fine with respect to metal content but then because the nanoparticles uh, they will have the uh, specific property uh, with respect to uh, size so that is why it's better to have uh, the limits with respect to uh, individual nanoparticles so in that direction uh, one uh, our other phd student dr tanushri uh, prasai so uh, we have worked basically we have published one paper that how to go about setting guidelines for this nanoparticles in water but then uh, with respect to uh, availability i mean with from the government side uh, we don't have in india and, and probably we don't have anywhere else also uh, only for let's say some uh, silica particles and uh, one or two more particles but not for all categories of particles in the water or air no country has uh, this type of guidelines right now i mean this is true for the nanoparticle also this is true for antibiotics also only for some of the antibiotic uh, probably people are working but all these uh, emerging contaminants uh, they are still in your uh, uh, basically uh, second list where people want to uh, i mean uh, push to make a individual com compound based guidelines and people want to make a compound based guidelines but still people are working with respect to uh, the category based guidelines uh, if you, as long as you are satisfying the metal based uh, criteria or if you are Certifying the organic matter based criteria, uh, then people can basically qualify that uh, compliance with respect to warning that okay you might be having these things, but we have not gone uh, so far uh, to really tell you okay we we should not be having basically silver nanoparticle or silver uh, silver content and the silver nanoparticle uh, beyond this limit. So we have not reached uh, to that limit yet. So uh, there was another question: uh, How to quantify nanoparticles uh, in water or sludge, or EC in water or sludge? The quantification. Right. So uh, as I said in the beginning, that uh, let's say. Um, so what we do in our lab is, uh, we I mean obviously we start with 0.45 micron filter paper. Uh, then the next filter paper we get is 0.2 micron. Then we get 0.02 micron also, 20 nanometer. So we go up to 20 nanometer. Obviously, when we started, we didn't have basically sonicators and all those. I mean, not sonicator, uh, centrifuge and all. So uh, we don't go, go for the centrifugation methods. But then people can apply a centrifugation method, and people can go very uh, low uh, dimensions. And then there they declare, okay, okay, beyond this, this is iron, and then nanoparticle. So in our uh, lab, we have been doing basically whatever pass through your 20 nanometer filter. So that is your uh, ions uh, category. And then uh, above your 20 nanometer, uh, and then obviously you can go bracket to basically 200 nanometers or 0.45 uh, micron uh, size. And in that way, we can have a subdivision of your uh, sizes. And then once you have the subdivision of the sizes, uh, sizes and once you have the particles, uh, then you can have basically a hydrodynamic diameter using your dynamic light scattering method. Uh, we can have metal content, we can have carbon content, total organic carbon. Uh, we can have all this uh, morphology characterization. We can have the mineralogy characterization. And uh, one more important item doing an environmental sample is we have to do the differentiation with respect to naturally occurring nanoparticles and uh, engineered or man-made uh, nanoparticles. So if you do all this activity, then we can say, okay, okay we have nanoparticle in our water. So uh, uh, doing all this activity, we published one paper uh, with Dr. Bernie Dharan. So uh, that was like first paper in, in for India uh, that how to measure nanoparticles in um, Delhi water in Yamuna River water. So we did that. Uh, so basically now, uh, then later on, uh, our uh, Dr. Tanushi Prasai, he uh, basically 
have more uh, characterizations. So now we have better understanding of measuring uh, these nanoparticles. Uh, with respect to sludge, so obviously, uh, see, one is obvious, uh, with respect to sludge, we have to basically go with respect to uh, morphology first, and then uh, morphology, and then again, we have to do a size fractionations. And again, we have to basically uh, do the, if you're talking about the metal based, or if you're talking about your carbon based, uh, we have to do a total metal uh, or your total carbon and then again apply the characterization methods. So that is how basically we have been doing it. People do uh, TEM edX, uh, basically transmission electron microscopy and uh, basically edX. And uh, that's how they, they try to get in. But it's like a combination of at least five, six methods. Uh, then only one can tell that whether we have nanoparticles of this magnitude and this type. So it's not a very routine, uh, easy exercise. Uh, but then this is a very important uh, item here. Okay, any other uh, question? Okay, so what we will do is uh, we will go to the next phase because I have, I think, some slides and uh, we will finish it. Then in between also we will uh, come back. So uh, as you're talking about the irrigation, uh, wastewater reuse activity. Uh, so what we did, uh, so generally what happens is that we have wastewater and uh, we, we have wastewater effluent and we want, because of the water stress, we want to use this type of wastewater. Uh, to see whether uh, we can use for growing vegetables or uh, non-edibles and then try to see whether uh, it can basically still grow your plants and uh, your uh, edibles, uh, they're still okay to eat or not. So in our group, basically, we try to see that, okay, if you're growing, if you're really using irrigation purpose, uh, we should grow uh, basically edibles and try to see how we can basically uh, treat the water so that we can still grow edible. And if that uh, treatment combination works, then it will solve basically the food sector uh, problem. So we are trying to basically look at the problem in this way. Instead of growing non-edibles, uh, we are exploring the issues and trying to basically see that uh, can we use this nanoparticle containing wastewater for growing edibles, leafy vegetables and all, and what are the issues and all this. So Dr. Divya Singh basically, uh, so she tried to uh, expose spinach uh, with copper oxide nanoparticle containing wastewater, zinc oxide nanoparticle containing wastewater. Later on, she did the mixture combination also. Try to see whether it can still basically uh, grow the vegetable uh, and then uh, whether your uh, copper based uh, metal or zinc based metals, whether they are still detected in your leafy vegetables or not. So she had basically 10 milligram per liter, 100 milligram per liter, 1000 milligram per liter concentrations. And obviously between zero and 10, uh, there was a difference. So it means obviously we didn't go for uh, intermediate concentrations uh, because we were looking from the industrial pollution side. So we were thinking that obviously if you take a surface water, then probably the concentration will be in your microgram per liter. So at max one milligram or 0.1 milligram per liter range. But if you look at from the industrial wastewater side, then you will have the concentration will be uh, higher. Uh, so that's why we were looking from this side. We, we could have done a one milligram per liter or something, but then we were seeing that, okay, whether the 10 milligram is going to be um, affecting the growth or not. So it's like a two-way uh, optimization uh, we were uh, doing that time. So uh, the safe concentration will be between zero and one mil 10 milligram per liter. Obviously, this is a very long bracket. One can modify more. But the idea is that uh, beyond 10 milligram per liter, there will be the uptake of our ions and which will be different uh, than your control. So that is not good. Obviously, right now we are just saying with respect to the iron content. Later on, we also did the uh, risk assessment to see whether this whatever uh, copper uh, which is coming in your uh, spinach leaves uh, because of the copper oxide nanoparticle source, whether that can give you health risk or not. So basically, uh, these were the some uh, photograph uh, Dr. Divya, uh, she took just to see whether it is going to basically affect the growth of the spinach leaves or not. Then later on, we also try to saw uh, that whether it is going to affect your seed for the next generation and whether it is going to basically affect your uh, germination uh, of your uh, next generation seed with respect to unexposed uh, seed. So she was doing that with respect to uh, radish and, and uh, basically we were trying to find out how it, it is going to uh, basically different with respect to seed quality, seed metal content and the uh, during your seed germination, uh, what uh, whether it is going to affect or not. So in general, this is very small uh, setup uh, to see whether, I mean, obviously we were not doing the standard test. We are just trying to see the actual application-based test. If you have, you have a wastewater, you want to see 
whether it can grow the plant or not and whatever contamination it is going to have uh, whether you can have a risk later on if you're going to uh, hypothetically as consuming so how everything is going to link up so as i was telling in the beginning that these things will give you the uh, the content which you are going to expose for example with respect to a uh, deodorant problem we are going to inhale so it means the pollutant is in the air and we are going to inhale let's say with respect to your uh, reddish or spinach problem so we are going to have a reddish or a spinach we are going to consume so this is at our exposure assessment uh, stage it means what is our daily exposure of your uh, reddish which is having some nanoparticle or what is our daily exposure of uh, daily consumption of uh, spinach which is having some nanoparticle now uh, we will try to use this uh, this type of information uh, in doing the risk assessment and how this information will be used in one of the steps and later on we have to find out more information and then uh, we can do um, detailed risk assessment so later on uh, dr divya basically uh, try to do the risk assessment and uh, here you can see that okay uh, we were having uh, hazard identification exposure dose response and risk characterization so as our telling you in the beginning what will be the hazard so let's say these nanoparticles or you have um, obviously we are talking about nanoparticle here but then we have nanoparticle antibiotics or pathogens so these are hazard we can they can uh, they can give you some toxic effects so this is growing the vegetable with this nanoparticle containing waste water and then some uh, copper contamination in your spinach leaf so this is my source of your uh, copper content and now this uh, when i'm going to get exposed to this spinach leaf when i'm going to eat it so this is my exposure so it means this information is going to come at your exposure assessment stage so once we have this information at your exposure assessment stage then we have to still work on dose response and risk characterization and all those things so it means whatever uh, time we have spent so far we were trying to basically focus on this type of thing that okay what is the source what is the concentration we were talking about the fate we are talking about the characterization uh, the monitoring methods and all those things so all those things are useful for knowing that okay what is the label in your contamination media and then then we will say okay, okay i am going to expose to that contamination let's say in my room uh, before coming uh, before starting the lecture i did something spray or something so now in a two hour activity what will be my inhalation what is the concentration of that uh, deodorant material and uh, all those things so those information are at your basically source it means the what is the label of your contaminant in your media and then i will be exposed to and then uh, we will do the dose response and risk characterization so before we go to the next stage you can again uh, take 5 minutes just try to link whatever we have done so far um, in last i think and now it's like close to 1 hour uh, in 1 hour session that how things are related we started with your uh, nanoparticle Uh, that okay, these are the problems and all those things. We try to see basically how nanoparticles. What are the sources where we have, we can have nanoparticles? They will come in the environment, uh, in the air environment, in the water environments, solid environments. I mean, soil environment, and and how we will be exposed to. So we we were discussing only these two portions: hazard identification and exposure system. So please take five minutes just to understand, make your notes. Uh, then we will uh, again proceed. If you have any question, you can ask. Uh, some earlier questions were missed out. Uh, can I read it now? Uh, it's yeah, please, please, please. Yeah. yeah. One is, uh, can nanoparticles be recycled? Uh, that was asked initially. Uh, maybe I missed it out at that time. Okay. So let's say um, we we have made. Let's say we I mean we talk the story of let's say copper oxide nanoparticle. So we copper oxide nanoparticle and how first of all uh, in the environment uh, it may be in the different form. one thing i mean obviously one can recover when when one has to do basically so much purification methods to clearly basically isolate this nanoparticles if you have not plant this nanoparticles i mean if you have not synthesized this nanoparticle basically through let's say magnetic nanoparticle something 
so then it is very difficult to isolate once you isolate then it will be modified surface modified it might be basically aggregated with other nanoparticles or let's say clay or it might be having some uh, humic acid adsorbed and all those things so those things will be there so now you will be having a modified or uh, transformed nanoparticle i mean maybe micro, uh, aggregated nanoparticle and an aggregated uh, particle so then we have to again see that okay what is the activity we want to use uh, from these aggregates where uh, we might be having some uh, nanoparticles or maybe aggregated uh, form of the particle so we can do it but only thing is like uh, in the in the water also in your waste water surface water they will be interacting with other constituents and those constituents will be basically making them aggregate uh, uh, maybe it's like a homo aggregation like say copper oxide copper oxide or hetero copper oxide zinc oxide copper oxide clay humic acid and all those things so it will be transformed and then we have to work with the transformed uh, particle and, and uh, then we have to see whether how uh, we can use for what purpose uh, okay uh, then uh, there is another question which is asked now that is from uh, amutham uh, please explain how concentration of nps in leaves or fruits can be studied right so um, okay we have a uh, some material so one is obviously as i said that we want to see in our case it was a pure solution so copper oxide in dni is water i mean you can have in the waste water also obviously so uh, because we were knowing that okay copper oxide is the only source of co copper here uh, so we took the leaf uh, we did the digestion and uh, we found the copper content uh, but then uh, now uh, people can basically obviously we can do a surface i mean uh, morphology study to isolate i mean uh, if you if you tag the nanoparticle with fluorescent dyes and all uh, we can see basically uh, in your leaf so you know, yes uh, these are the tagged uh, particles and uh, we can basically again uh, increase the resolution we can find go to the size when I mean, nanometer range and get the size of the uh, basically particles and uh, then we can have a correlations to find out uh, what is the copper uh, copper oxide nanoparticle content in your uh, spinach leaf and uh, but as long with respect to risk assessment or with respect to metal contamination uh, copper containing is still very much good information because uh, uh, with respect to regulatory guidelines uh, it will be coming from the copper uh, content so as long as we know that okay copper oxide was the source and this much copper is coming and the, this this much copper is coming from 100 i mean 100% is coming from copper oxide nanoparticle or let's say some x percentage is coming from the copper oxide nanoparticle uh, then it is fine but with respect if you really want to know Uh, how much copper oxide nanoparticle is there in my uh, spinach leaf then one thing obviously we can tag and we can uh, do the analysis from that side and uh, basically we can do uh, surface morphology and analysis uh, to basically go to the nanometer range and then we can tag it uh, and in that way sometimes people uh, try to uh, get correlation with respect to spiked or uh, unspiked samples okay then there was another uh, again older question uh, can uh, nanoparticle be incinerated or can nano uh, dis that whether that can be a disposal option that was asked earlier like not now so uh, first of all i have not worked on the incineration or disposal aspects so probably i am not be able to give the complete answer uh, but then as long as see uh, this metal oxide nanoparticle or carbon based particles so you can i mean you can see the problem in a reverse way uh, those things which you can incinerate obviously uh, you then you can see whether copper oxide nanoparticle or uh, fullerene whether they will be coming under that category or not and then from there that side uh, you can basically see the answer uh, because of this so generally what we are seeing is whether if you have metal oxide can we incinerate or not or if you have let's say carbon based material maybe it's like a, a aggregate micron sized material or um, basically your nanometer range material whether we can do the incineration because I mean, if i give a very uh, i mean partially complete i mean partially correct answer if the temperature is very high obviously carbon material will go so uh, whether it is in a nanometer range or micron range uh, i mean it will not matter so only thing is right now i mean uh, when you are going to do incineration we need to know basically what is the content in that material uh, which are in the nanometer range and then uh, in that way. So probably answer will be yes but i don't know the detail aspect Uh, then uh, i have a small doubt yes. uh, suppose uh, say you conducted this experiment with nanoparticles now had it been uh, uh, the metal ions same quantity then would you expect the result to be different 
Yes. So it was not in the nanoparticle form. Rather, it was uh, maybe metal solution was added to uh, bring the same concentration. Yeah, yeah. So we had this zinc ion copper ion also. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. No. Right. No. Uh, I mean, is it? Will it be different if it is nanoparticle or just the metal ions? Yes. So generally, uh, my point is, is it not the quantity alone that matters? No, the quantity alone doesn't matter uh, because see, uh, the uh, nanoparticles are also going to give you ions. Uh, yeah. So when we have uh, water, waste water, let's say DNA is water or uh, surface water is spiked with nanoparticles or surface water. So uh, this nanoparticle and the ions, they will be in the equilibrium. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so now uh, we are going to apply to the soil. So this nanoparticle, they will be basically reaching to the roots uh, environment depending on the filtration and all those aspects. And the ions will also basically reach to the root environment depending on the filtration and uh, adsorption aspects. And then uh, this root is going to basically uh, uptake your ions and nanoparticles. So at that stage, the chances of uptaking of ions is more as compared to uh, nanoparticles. So it means uh, we can have basically more toxicity due to uh, ions in some case. So it's like with respect to toxicity, it's like a combined uh, observations people have noted. Uh, but then uh, if it, this nanoparticles are still in the nanometer range, uh, and if the root cells basically they can interact, and uh, so they can still uptake it, but the ions are basically more easily uptaken and uh, transported. Essentially means that uh, nanoparticles will be lesser toxic for this pathway, right? Yeah. It'll have lesser I mean, risk. Yeah. Right. I mean, lesser risk uh, if, if this nanoparticles are converted into uh, aggregates, I mean, micron size is a little bit higher larger size and they are not able to enter into uh, the roots. So if they are not able to enter through the root, then obviously it will not be basically uh, taken up upward. Uh, but yeah, but uh, I mean, if you just have copper oxide alone uh, as an initial source, and because these nanoparticles, they will have very small, I mean, less dissolution. I mean, this uh, dissolution uh, percentage is very small. So uh, whatever is going to come, that is from the copper oxide source only. But then if you have copper ion, so copper ion is only uh, I mean ion uh, source, but if we assume that okay, uh, we have we start with the copper oxide nanoparticle, but then later on we try to uh, differentiate the effect. Ki, okay, what will the effect due to copper ions which is coming from your copper oxide dissolution? So under wastewater, I mean under um, room temperature conditions, dissolution will be less. Uh, obviously, with respect to wastewater pH, so whatever effect we will be getting, that we will be getting because of the nanoparticle. Okay, okay. Uh, then is there any quantification of the aggregation of nanoparticles done? Like any anywhere you have come across that study? I mean, uh, after use, uh, you know, one, one possible trait is aggregation of the nanoparticle, as you said. So is there any quantification of uh, that uh, carried out anywhere? Any? Yeah, so I mean, uh, uh, the, I think you were telling about the initial thing when we do in a sweep coagulation or primary sedimentation and all. So uh, these nanoparticles, uh, they can aggregate. Because, I mean, obviously, uh, there is really less chance of home aggregation. It, it means like aggregation between copper oxide and copper oxide. But then um, it can basically aggregate with other nano, other particle, let's say clay or uh, uh, zinc oxide or any other particle. So uh, our uh, student, basically, Dr. Tanushri, uh, so she studied this uh, stability of uh, mixture of nanoparticles, let's say copper oxide with zinc oxide and with clay, uh, dual mixture and three particle system and all. So yes, I mean, uh, these obviously these things are happening in the environment so that is why i was telling that if you want to recover then obviously we have to see that aspect and then the method will be same i mean with the characterization method will be same that we have to do go with the filtration method a series of filters and then we have to again go through the every filter we have to characterize and we have to go through all those uh, uh, basically um, dynamic light scattering method and your uh, okay. characterization methods so we have to do only thing is like uh, we will say, okay, okay uh, this is the characterization for, for the particle between these two filter ranges, and like that we can proceed. Okay, okay. Then Amudam B is asking, how the hazard quotient is estimated? Uh, is it based on the expected effects or any receptor? So I think that this hazard uh, quotient is a standard calculation. Anyway, sir, uh, you can answer. Uh, yes, so yes, yes. Please ask. Yeah. Right. So um, obviously later on we will come to at the end, but the uh, see. Uh, this hazard is obviously right now we have nanoparticle and they're going to have some toxic effect. So this effect is, let's say, known or established for some cases. Uh, basically, regulatory bodies have given some limits. So once we know our exposure value, obviously, 
and then uh, once we know the dose response information from the published literature or, or from the regulatory body we will try to compare it and then uh, so generally we do for the hypothetical studies uh, like so far i have done only hypothetical studies i have not done any real observations from the field human subject uh, but then uh, people try to do uh, that type of study but it's like uh, in between it becomes very gray i mean in terms of linking the field observation and the health effect so in our work like we do hypothetical and i will try to show the steps how we do it i think this we have covered uh, again hazard is basically we, we are taking the exam, example of nanoparticles and uh, so it can give you different type of effects it can give you the effect due to ions and it can give you the effect of, uh, basically nanoparticle also and uh, there will be some characteristics which is going to define whether it will persist in the environment or not and whether it is going to toxic toxicity to your um, oral pathway or uh, dermal pathway or uh, air pathway so those things one need to find out then only we will say whether let's say for example iron oxide nanoparticle so iron oxide nanoparticle will not be termed as a hazard unless the concentration is very very high but let's say your uh, titanium oxide nanoparticle or silver oxide nan silver nanoparticle so they can be termed as hazardous uh, if the concentration com comes into your milligram per liter range also so these are the, some of the papers basically i think this is like very old uh, slide now uh, we should be updating uh, but then people basically have been establishing yes they are toxic to uh, uh, different uh, categories of species uh, aquatic species rats uh, human beings and all and now there are ma uh, many detailed papers uh, in this direction so this is one example just a regular uh, risk assessment example that how to find out the hazard so we have oil spill on a road or let's say release of particulate substance in the corner of a room we are talking about the deodorant example or leaching of substance from the landfill uh, flood of river bank so these are the uh, some uh, scenarios and under this scenario we have to find out what is the hazard and uh, what info uh, we need to characterize this okay so what i will do is uh, in the interest of time i will take the example two so let's say we have a deodorant and we know that we have some uh, let's say hypothetically silver nanoparticle so uh, depending on at what rate we are releasing the environment and uh, depending on the ventilation condition or air flow condition and all uh, they they will be in that indoor uh, room and uh, then we can say what was the size of the particle which was uh, basically released and uh, we can do some cal simple calculations to find out how long will it take to come to the basically floor and then how long they will be in the in your suspension i mean in your um, suspended form in the air and then that so this these two informations are going to decide the concentration but before that uh, if somebody is saying okay i am releasing silver and a particle and right now if i don't know anything then uh, i have to find out whether silver and a particle is really problematic or not for human health so i have to go through the standard database to find out what is the health effect of silver and a particle once you know okay, okay this is the health effect of silver and a particle then only i will put that uh, this silver and a particle which is coming from your spray of your deodorant under your hazard category so this is a very important uh, activity Mo many times or maybe sometimes people observe many things but then uh, we have to see whether everything is is problematic with respect to human health or not so this information becomes this first level screening becomes very important if you don't have the information about toxicity of uh, these things for your human health it is become very difficult to put them in a hazard category for example oil spill so when the oil spill happens this is the event so then we have to see basically on the road uh, what are the things which are going to be on your uh, road surface which are what are the things which are going to be in your uh, air and then what is the composition what is the toxic effect of those uh, constituents whether they are going to be problematic for human health or not once we uh, get the information that yes they will be problematic for human health then only we will say okay now we have a hazard and we, we should do a risk assessment okay so that is how the first stage become very important so okay we will skip this so then the second stage come exposure assessment step so in your exposure assessment step for example uh, i was taking the let's say we are doing the deodorant example so let's say i am uh, in this room for 2 hours so in 2 hours and let's say uh, once in a month or every day or um, once in a year or something so this is basically we need to find out what is the exposure frequency and then uh, depending on my inhalation rate we need to find out what is the exposure rate it means at what rate you are drinking water at what rate you are consuming fish or you are consuming your uh, leafy vegetable every day and uh, how much quantity every day so these type of information uh, we need to knowing it 
once we know it, uh, once we know this information then we can calculate your exposure dose so for example in the case of air we will calculate inhaled dose it means uh, what is the dose of uh, silver nanoparticle i am inhaling uh, of due to uh, this contaminated air okay so uh, in that way we will calculate your exposure assessment stage uh, value uh, exposure dose so this is one example again this example is basically a little bit uh, with respect to uh, heavy metals which might be coming from your uh, solar photovoltaics but then it also give you the basic the framework which people can use it uh, to doing the risk assessment so let's say this is the sun scenario leaching scenario uh, many people can relate it you can see you might be seeing basically many uh, open uh, landfills i mean basically open area where things are dumped and if uh, depending on the rain water and all the things can basically leach it can contaminate your uh, soil it can contaminate your gr ground and if somebody is basically playing there or occupational worker who are using the land uh, soil so they might be exposed to so this type of information we need to find out so exposure uh, population receptor is also important uh, so for example some uh, volcano is uh, erupting and nobody is living there so only um, environment is going to be a receptor human beings are very far and they have a very less chance of this thing so obviously we will not be doing the health risk assessment there uh, but then is uh, human health let's say landfills and people are living very close to the landfill those people who go and work in the landfill uh, so they are really a uh, direct uh, receptors so we should be identifying those uh, population category groups and then uh, we should be basically uh, finding out their frequency uh, of your ex of your exposure and the magnitude of the exposure and then we should be basically doing the risk assessment for each of the category population so um, obviously if you are talking about let's say oral so food food is the one source by which we can get the oral exposure water is another source uh, dermal skin exposure inhalation exposure so this is a very good uh, source exposure factors handbook i mean uscp 90, 1997 people have now it is modified also so you can i mean you should if you are doing a risk assessment uh, you should definitely have this book so uh, uh, this handbook is basically have is having a compilation of uh, exposure rates obviously this is for us population unless you have the data for your case uh you can use this uh, values you can mention this is the assumption i have taken from this source and then you can proceed with the risk assessment because as long as i mean you can vary the exposure rate or exposure uh, quantity per day uh, once you do the survey and once you modify the information but then uh, approach and the any first calculation uh, will be a right uh, way away uh, if you use this type of handbook so for example this is a one equation average daily dose so add ingestion is the name of the pathway because we are ingesting we are taking something from mouth and uh, add is basically average daily dose so milligram is the quantity uh, kg is coming from the body weight and per day so this is ir is your ingestion rate it means how much water or how much food we are taking every day cw is a concentration of your pollutant in your water or in your food you can adjust the unit ed is your exposure duration how many days then we have to normalize with respect to body weight we have to normalize with respect to averaging time so now uh, this averaging time it means uh, we, we consume something and then it is going to give you some uh, effect and it is going to give you some effect over some duration so if you are talking about the cancer uh, cancers i mean obviously once we uh, classify your contaminant in the with respect to hazard we will come to know whether it is going to give you non cancer effect or cancer effect so if you are going to do uh, get a uh, cancer based effect because of that particular contaminant then we can say okay uh, we are going to normalize with respect to 70 years i mean you can we can find out the average uh, life expectancy for indian population we can put it there well I mean, you can mention 70 years you can put 70 years also but if you are talking about uh, let's say non cancerous uh, health effect uh, then we can uh, basically equate that with respect to exposure duration it means if i am exposed to 30 minutes then i need to basically normalize my uh, average daily dose with respect to 30 minute exposure once we do this then we will be getting average daily dose ingestion uh, information similar uh, formula will be basically little bit uh, tweaked uh, to find out what is the average daily dose for your inhalation so let's take 5 minutes just to uh, see on this slide and try to see how things are happening because if you understand uh, this uh, one uh, equation then we can apply for inhalation rate we can apply for uh, dermal exposure and uh, we should be basically uh, able to correct, uh, accurately characterize your exposure quantity so this we have to do for let's say child um, 
adults, occupational worker, residential, pregnant women, senior person. So every category uh, for whom you want to do a risk assessment. Okay. So please take five minutes on this slide just to understand what is happening here. And then we will go to the next one. And if you have any question, you can ask. No, no new questions in the chat box. Okay, sure. Yes, someone has a question? Good morning, sir. Yes, yes. Hello. Ah, Boli, uh, yes. My question is that there are so many industrial waste coming from industry and and uh, they are using for farming and how the, that uh, farm, farming product in affecting the life of women, sir. Because there are so many people who are using those water of contaminating of so many wastage. Can you please one, say one more time, please? Sir, I want to ask about, sir, uh, contaminant water and from industrial waste, so coming from using for, that as using for farming, sir, and then uh, agriculture, in agriculture, then how that agriculture product will affect uh, human life, sir? Yeah, yeah. So that's what I was telling to, I was trying to uh, study, right? Remember, we were talking about the nanoparticle containing wastewater study. So uh, let's say you can see any industry. I mean, it depends on the industry, what industry wastewater you want to uh, focus. So let's say if you're focusing on the pharmaceutical industry wastewater. So yes, you have a, a wastewater treatment plant, and uh, then obviously this industry is going to do some treatment and some wastewater effluent is going to come out. You can find out what is the uh, concentration of uh, Basically, your uh, pharmaceutical drugs or your uh, compounds are uh, which are still there, and then uh, you can grow vegetables just like I did, uh, Dr. Divya did, and we can see basically whether that is affecting your uh, plant uh, agriculture yield or not. Is the concentration of your uh, trace contaminant which you had in your uh, wastewater, whether that is detected in your uh, leafy vegetables or not, and then uh, we can see basically. Uh, whether that is going to do a problem or not, we can do a theoretical risk assessment after that. Uh, and then we can have a good idea whether this is going to be really safe to use uh, trace concentration of uh, pharmaceutical compounds which are still there in your wastewater effluent and you want to use for uh, irrigation purpose. But sir, that vegetable grown from that water will be harmful for health, no sir? So how do you know that whether that will be harmful or not? That is what we are doing here, right? We are trying to do a numerical method way to understand what is the what is the extent of harmful effect. Yes, sure. See, one thing is obviously we have to see whether it is affecting your yield, right? So obviously, 
uh, depending if, it, if the water is having good uh, nutrients and uh, no uh, no contaminant basically uh, no heavy metal only compound it is so it is going to basically uh, affect that things so, right but then we have to see uh, what is the contamination of uh, that thing in your uh, i mean what, what, what is your contamination of your leafy vegetable or your uh, crop uh, with respect to metal or with respect to particular compounds and uh, then we have to risk assessment because if you don't have the uh, guideline i mean easily available guideline then you have to apply this type of uh, detailed methods Okay, so then uh, if you're talking about let's say soil exposure, I mean exposure of your contaminant from the soil or let's say groundwater, so we can modify your equations a little bit and then we can we should be able to basically calculate your average daily dose. So this is basically a list which is going, telling you that whatever information we have to really compile to do the risk assessment. For example, we, we should be able to know what is the body weight, exposure frequency, exposure du time, duration, ingestion rate of your soil, ingestion rate of your groundwater, exposed uh, skin surface area, then uh, how much of that thing is going to stick to your uh, skin, and then uh, dermal absorption factor, your averaging time, and uh, averaging time for your carcinogen non -term. So this type of information we have to detail for your uh, children, adult, occupational worker, residential workers, uh, residential population, and then we can use for calculating your exposure dose. Once we calculate the exposure dose, then we come to your uh, dose response uh, stage. And uh, for dose response stage, then we have to compile the literature uh, and then try to see whether we have the guideline value easily available, which we can use or we have to do or uh, take the help of uh, talk, uh, basically published uh, literature. Uh, we have to derive our uh, guideline values or reference dose, and then we can use for this uh, risk assessment. So again, very quickly, uh, this is the example where we, we can have the exposure from the fish, from the swimming activity. So it means we have to uh, calculate our exposure dose from uh, eating uh, fish, which is contaminated from your nanoparticle wastewater, or um, basically the water which we have ingested during swimming activity. So we will be having uh, two types of uh, average daily dose. And because those uh, these two are again for the oral pathways, then we can add them. Uh, then yeah, for the reference dose uh, stage, dose response, we have to find out what is the value which we can compare. And then we can calculate your uh, risk value. So again, this is a very uh, detailed diagram, but very quickly the idea is that uh, we'll be doing those things. And in between when uh, the things go in our uh, human body, in digestive system, uh, basically we can also understand, obviously right, I mean, this is a like one level detailed one, that uh, what is the chance that, uh, or what is the magnitude of your uh, things which are going to dissolve or dissociate in your uh, human digestive media. So uh, Dr. Tanushri basically, she incorporated this uh, aspect in her uh, risk assessment work, uh, that, that uh, if, if you have a nanoparticle containing product, let's say water or uh, edibles, and when you are going to ingest, uh, and then it is going to come in our stomach. So how that is going to interact with the digestive system uh, fluid, basically your uh, gastric acid, and how much of that nanoparticle is going to convert it into ions, and how much of that is going to still remaining into nanoparticle. So once we have uh, that information, then we can have a better idea instead of relying on the, the uh, 
exposure dose which you are doing from the concentration from the water. So this is like a one level uh, detailed uh, step that uh, instead of uh, basically uh, using calculating. Calculating the average dose using your uh, surface water value, we try to calculate the average dose with respect to the value which you get after uh, dissolution or interaction with the diastole medium. So uh, please take five minutes on this slide because obviously this slide is very detailed, but then it can give you the idea that uh, where we do uh, this discussion right now and what more we can have information to have the more detail. So you can start from here. We have a nanoparticle in water. So we will have some exposure. So one is obviously the fish consumption of fish or uh, surface water ingestion. Then we will have two types of uh, your uh, exposure doses. As I mentioned that we are eating some fish. We are also doing a swimming activity and we are ingesting water also. Now things are going in my body, uh, in my stomach. And there uh, it is basically interacting my, my gastric acid, uh, stomach fluid. And it is going to give me some uh, nanoparticle concentration, ion concentration after your uh, digestion and then then that value I will be using for uh, estimating the risk. Then we will get, get the dose response information and find out the risk. Okay. Any question on this uh, slide? Okay. Any thought? Any question? So basically, you can think and then uh, you can write. Yeah. Okay. So I think this activity we will skip. Write down your ingestion related parameters, calculate your exposure dose, and uh, write equations later on. I mean, uh, when you are free, you can write. So uh, in the dose response, as I was telling that we can have carcinogenic and non-carcinogenic uh, compounds. So first of all, this uh, USAP website, Integrated Risk Information System, IRIS. This is a very good website uh, because uh, if you go uh, to this website, you can search any compound and if they have compiled, it will give you uh, what is the toxic effect, what type of toxic effect, whether it is giving you carcinogenic effect or non-carcinogenic effect. And then you can get the reference value. So for example, for carcinogen, we look for slow factor. So when you read the document, you will look for the slow factor. Uh, sometimes you will go, going to get an oral slow factor. It means uh, oral pathway and the slow factor is the, uh, basically the value response versus dose, dose value. And whatever the slope response uh, over dose, so that is a slow factor. So USCP basically they have already cal calculated this slow factor for carcinogens and they have compiled there. So let's say we're talking about arsenic and arsenic is giving you cancer effect from oral pathway. And we will go to uh, this website. We will search for arsenic. We will get the document. We will search for oral uh, pathway and the uh, cancer effect. And then you will get oral slow factor. So it means now I have this some value uh, for oral slow factor for arsenic. Later on, when you are going to have um, your uh, average daily dose of arsenic, and then we can use these two information now to calculate my risk. Okay, so this is for your carcinogen. Similarly, for non-cancer, non-carcinogen, this is called reference concentration. Or if you multiply by exposure parameter, you will get reference uh, dose. So this is the concentration. It means up to this concentration, you will not going to have any significant health effect. Okay, uh, once we know the reference concentration, we can multiply by the exposure parameter. You can get acceptable daily intake. So there is a difference here. One is average daily intake. It means what is the rate at which every day you are some, exposed to something. And then there is one dose which is called acceptable. It means what is the acceptable daily intake, which is okay for arsenic also, or let's say for other uh, contaminant or for triclosan also. So once we know your average daily intake, and once you know your acceptable daily intake, you can use these two information now to find out your risk. So obviously, uh, this acceptable daily intake, you have a reference concentration. If you see here, you can have a arsenic in your water. So that is your monitored concentration. 
the reference concentration is that concentration which is not going to give you any toxic effect. Then you can multiply with your exposure parameters. You can find out your acceptable daily intake. Once you have the acceptable daily intake, you can uh, use your uh, average daily intake value also, and then you can find out the risk. Later on, we will see. So now if you come to the nanoparticle thing, as I was mentioning in the beginning, for nanoparticle, these reference values are not very easily uh, detailed. So people have to basically go through the literature and uh, compile the data, and then they try to find out basically what could be the reference dose. So people are still doing or still compiling the reference doses so that they can use uh, in doing the typical risk assessment. So uh, we will skip this part and later on we will very quickly see that how we can use uh, these dose, uh, uh, basically the animal toxicity data to calculate the risk of reference dose for human health. So this equation, reference dose, obviously we are looking the, for the reference dose for human being. This LOAEL, this is basically called low observed adverse effect. It means this is some concentration value which is going to give you low observed. It means you can observe the effect, but that will be very small effect. And this effect we will be doing from the animal study, let's say rat study. Obviously, we do, I mean, we are, when I say we, it means like we are getting the data from the literature. So uh, we get, uh, we see the rat based studies. Let's say hypothetically, we say, uh, rat based study for titanium oxide nanoparticle oral exposure. So we will be reading the paper trying to get this data, whether they have LOL value or not. And we have to apply some uncertainty factors. So one first is U1. It means LOAL to NOL conversion. So we want to have no observed adverse effect because in the beginning we were telling that what is the lowest concentration which will not give you any effect. So that is called NOL. But then in the lab, we will be measuring the lowest observed because we don't know what is no observed. So we like depending on the detection limit and all, we will be measuring LOL. So there will be one uncertainty factor, uh, VF1, which is going to tell about LOL to NOL conversion. The other is exposure duration. In the lab, we do a short term study and uh, in the field, which I mean in the real life, we will have a long term exposure. So there is a correction factor, uncertainty factor for uh, low exposure, I mean small exposure to long exposure conversion. Interspecies, it means from rat to uh, human, we need to apply one uncertainty factor. Intra-individual, it means uh, within human also, uh, we will have the variation. So we have to incorporate that variation. Data quality, there are certain minimum number of uh, samples, minimum number of repeats, uh, and the minimum number of basically uh, red, uh, I mean, uh, this toxicity study protocol, one has to follow. So if there is uncertainty in there, then we have to incorporate that also. So when Ananda, our first MT student, she was doing it, so we were trying to see uh, the in vitro to in vivo now many work has been done so probably now we can have more quantitative idea here but this is at the in 2011 that time we were thinking that we should have an uncertainty factor form in vitro to in vivo conversion so we have to apply these five uncertainty factors and then uh, taking the LVL data from the rat study then we can get the reference dose for human being so obviously we can apply some values we can give some values to these uncertainty factors and once we have the answer, then we will get the RFD for your human being. Once we have the RFD uh, reference dose for human being, average daily dose, we have already know how to calculate in your exposure assessment stage. We can calculate hazard quotient. And this HQ is for your non-cancer effects. So HQ is your hazard quotient and uh, we can have, so in this way, we can calculate the HQ or risk estimate for your ingestion pathway. Now again, this activity we will skip so that we will have some time to answer. Uh, so we can basically, uh, depending on what the contaminant you are picking, we have to search this information and we can calculate the risk in this way. The uh, this way we will uh, skip uh, for the interest of time so that we can have discussion. So the, let's say we have done this for one uh, contaminant, but then you can have many contaminants. Then how to do uh, this type of thing? So one uh, approach is basically we can do the risk assessment for every contaminant. Once we do the risk assessment for every contaminant, we can do the risk ranking. I mean, you can uh, take the contaminant which is posing the highest risk on the top and you can basically rank all the contaminants in decreasing order. Once you rank all the contaminant uh, with, with respect to risk, then you can take top three, top five or something, or you can make uh, different categories, I mean, different groups of your uh, contaminant and you can prioritize your uh, work so that you can focus on the monitoring and uh, basically uh, risk management uh, activity. 
Okay, so this exercise, I think I have shared the slides with, to uh, Professor Vargasi. Uh, so he may, might be like uh, basically sharing with you. But the main idea is to do the risk estimation. Once we do the risk estimation, then we can make the list priority with respect to human health. And then based on the priority, we can find out top three or top five, and then we can do a, a risk assessment. So this is a, a slide with respect to nanoparticle, but then this is applicable for uh, uh, different uh, emerging contaminants. So what happens is basically we synthesize something, and then it will be go, going to the uh, Will we get exposure uh, today? How many people will be getting exposed to something? Then do a risk assessment. We need toxicity data, and uh, there are tasks we have considered for getting the toxicity data. So for example, uh, we need to know the property. We need whether the I think we just discussed about uh, five or six uncertainty factors. So those things we have to incorporate. Then we will get the reference value. Uh, once we have the reference dose, we can calculate the risk. And uh, this reference dose and risk regulation both are interlinked. Obviously, if there were a basically a regulation value, then there is no need to find for us to find out the reference dose values. But if there is no regulation uh, value, then we have to do this type of exercise and uh, then come up with the risk estimate. And then we have to find out whether we need to have a positive effect, feedback, or negative feedback, and whatever actions we have to do. This is basically uh, my last slide. Uh, here I have written with respect to nanoparticles, but this is applicable for all category of uh, emerging contaminants. We have to do a trade off of uh, the benefits or the usage of uh, these emerging contaminants. And we have to also incorporate uh, the effect uh, they are going to basically have on the environment and human health, short term and long term. Uh, then we should basically. Uh, make the decision. So I think it's a big responsibility. So for those people who synthesize nanoparticles for different uh, products, they should be basically taking taking the first role in making only those products which will be safe for the environment. Uh, because if finally comes to us, so it's like I mean my approach that it it, it it is finally come to us so that we should be able to understand that what we synthesize whether that is really going to have the um, safe if effect on the environment and the human health. So now, if you have a question, you can ask. Uh, so there is one question from participants. Yes. In some cases, the means of exposure is determined by the nature of the toxic substances. Can we apply the same calculation for this toxic ends? This is the question. See, I mean. Okay, the first thing is uh, that uh, this means of, I mean, the, the hazard type, so that is independent of the exposure. I mean, obviously, it will depend on the medium, but then in a given medium, uh, whatever uh, contaminant we have, we have to subclassify whether this is going to be a hazardous or not. And obviously, in somewhere, it will link to that what type of a receptor you are keeping in mind, and we are trying to find out the, whether this is going to be hazardous or not. But that exercise is already been done. It's not that every day people has to do that exercise. Then only you are going to find out whether this is something hazardous or not. I mean, unless it is something very unknown compound or uh, unknown uh, contaminant, then obviously the toxicity the groups, the toxicologists, and all those people are going to basically um, explore the new question. Otherwise, most of the things are very much established. Uh, okay, sir. There is one more question. Uh, are nanoparticles really bad for environment? This is from Manoj Singh. Okay, so uh, see that's why basically I did so much exercise, right? And uh, so it is very hard to say whether this is really bad for the environment uh, because uh, depending on okay, so directly I don't have any answer that it is very bad for environment or not. I mean, I if I have to basically uh, really give the answer, then I will qualify by many conditions. Uh, whatever nanoparticle we are asking and what is the load we have in the environment. So depending on the load in the environment, uh, we can see whether this is really problematic or not. So in the short run, maybe no, but in the long run, yes. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. There is few more questions. Uh, so this question actually, uh, is, is a continuation of the old question. If so, what was before when technology was not there? It means like uh, uh, in the environment, there were no, many nanoparticles and before the innovation of new technology for the removal and assessment, what would have happened? I mean that. 
right so basically you see those things were there also obviously and uh, the exposure was there also but maybe we didn't know uh, see because of these things now we know uh, what are the contributors and uh, so this is one important information now we know what are the contribution contributors and where we can focus the effect are there because of the technology we know which component is giving what and uh, what to modify or what to do uh, basically uh, what to remove in all those things so if we compare uh, see maybe let's say we get into something we might be exposed to these nanoparticles uh, but we might not be knowing what type of nanoparticle is there and uh, what uh, type of treatment we should do now today we can customize our uh, waste water treatment for removing let's say titanium oxide nanoparticles but maybe earlier we were not focusing on one type of particular let's see today we can customize our uh, adsorption of biological treatment for removing trichloroquin or covid virus but earlier we might was uh, not knowing what to uh, customize for what type of remove earlier we was using the indicator based things and now we can go for compound specific things uh, and then obviously it is a cost uh, implication so we can go for the most toxic compounds and then we can at least ensure that the most toxic compounds are removed uh, from the waste water so that it is not going to the environment or if it is in the surface water it should be removed in the drinking water treatment plant so that is where the benefit is to knowing what we don't know uh, so that we can uh, uh, do more uh, active uh yes sir there is one more question can one utilize the nanoparticle for the recovery of metal nanoparticles from waste water is it possible yes, right i think uh, we have entered we, we we were discussing this aspect so i think that we have done yeah uh, so one second sir yeah, I, i have a, i have a question uh, to yeah Huh, so, uh, I mean, in fact, uh, we have uh, uh, the dose-response relationship available from IRIS. Now, uh, what does your take on using that directly for nanoparticles? For example, say you have silver nanoparticles, and can we use the information in IRIS on silver for silver nanoparticles? Because uh, the effect could be slightly different, no? Yeah. So basically, first of all, uh, for silver for nanoparticles, they don't have. Okay. The, info the information is not there in iris. Uh, no, but for example, silver, uh, silver will have right. Silver as a as a metal, uh, probably R F value, R F T values are available, right? Yeah, as a metal we have, but the uh, huh. nanoparticles, uh, basically for the nanoparticles, it is not there. So as I said, that ions and nanoparticles they will have different toxic effects. Yeah. So so there will there will be an error. So I have pasted one more paper which Tanushri has done it. and that paper has a good compilation of 10 nanoparticles for uh, water medium and it has reference those also so okay. uh, this can be used basically for this nanoparticles basically uh, now reference doses from taken can be taken from this paper and then uh, okay. the risk assessment can be done okay okay so basically uh, at least in this case of uh, silver you expect the risk to be or rfd values to be higher for nanoparticles rather than the elemental silver right Yes. yes 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 there is one more question sir uh -huh. is there a chance that risk assessment studies be biased as the studies are usually focused see i mean if you see the the scope of biasness uh right now uh, okay so let's say one is the first the first stage is the hazard identification stage so if we are having the basically the data from the published i mean obviously the peer reviewed material and all that okay the, these things are hazardous or not and then uh, for the exposure assessment stage what is the concentrations so obviously we are going to have a numerical value of your concentrations we are going to have a detailed information about your uh, exposed population and uh, the exposure of that particular thing from that medium and then uh, this uh, numerical uh, steps basically your calculation of average daily dose and then getting the reference dose so the reference dose is the most uh, basically tricky aspect and uh, whatever we have from the uscp iris you can do it uh, otherwise it's like a based on the qualitative judgment i mean with respect to obviously uh, there are standard agencies like for example oecd or uh, eca so unless that is not approved from there for example what tanushri did what we did we have applied it's like a peer reviewed article 
now the next stage is basically to uh, if uh, OECD uh, basically assimilates this and use in, uh, in its uh, basically one of the guidelines or something, then it's like an accepted version. So that is where I mean you can see that okay we are we as a promoters or basically we we have done the study, and so that is where the biasness based on our availability of the literature and all those things. Uh, but if it is reviewed by let's say a big a committee, I mean big panel, and then if it is approved from them, then it will be just like a USCP Iris method or guideline values. So those things can happen, and in that stage we are basically the effect of panel uh, assessment of the information. Those things come. Uh, I hope there is no more question at hand. Yeah. George said there is no more question at hand. Yeah, if some participants want to ask directly, they can. Uh... So, so there is one question. question. Uh, many studies are being focused on nano emulsions. Is it harmful? So, I don't know actually. See, I mean, uh, we can see. Uh, I think, I mean, if you have to study the, let's say, if I have to theoretically study this aspect, uh, what, I, what I will, the way I will proceed is basically I will try to find out what is the metal content, what is the carbon content, and uh, basically what is the size data from for this suspension. And then I will try to basically go the same method, uh, and then we will try to calculate the risk, and then I can uh, give you the answer. someone who was about to ask a question please proceed yeah yes sir sir uh, in, in the second activity your first question was how do you dispose uh, the nanoparticles that you use in, uh, in your day-to-day -day life so is there any ways uh, that you can suggest uh, in such a way that we effectively uh, dispose the nanoparticles that we are using in our day-to-day -day life other than minimizing the use of right so um, okay, so I mean, if I uh, if I go with the established procedure, so there is one method called which is called uh, uh, basically toxicity characteristic leaching procedure test (TCLP). Uh, and TCLP test uh, it covers basically metal-based pollution, it covers ornic-based ornic, -based, ornic uh, compound-based pollution. So if your product is not is not violating the TCLP test criteria, then this is fine. I mean. This is what, like uh, now, basically, I'm working in this direction to see uh, how to link uh, this nanoparticle uh, related waste disposal to uh, comply with the TCLP uh, based methods. Uh, because the uh, TCLP method, it is not talking about basically any particular form of the thing, it is talking about the waste, whether it is in uh, semi basically colloidal form or obligated forms. As long as it is not exceeding your guideline values. Uh, then it is fine. But again, there is a little bit gap there because it, it will give you uh, the standards with respect to ions or only compounds. It will not give you the standards with respect to this part. But yes, I mean, as for the available tool, right now, TCLP is the best way to go. Uh, Uh, after conducting risk assessment, what are the probable treatment technologies for emerging contaminants? Right. So I think, see, I mean, uh, the whatever the conventional we have, I mean, first of all, we have to do that evaluation. So, for example, uh, this uh, coagulation population method, I mean, uh, that is still good uh, for nanoparticle removal. Uh, only we have to keep the focus on the nanoparticle removal also in the mind when we uh, try to find out the optimization or the, the dose in all those parameters. Adsorption, I mean, uh, our uh, student Dr. Tropita, so she did with basically activated carbon-based uh, filtration of these nanoparticles. And these days, many people synthesize many uh, macroporous materials and all. So they can synthesize uh, those materials and they try to capture nanoparticles. And this uh, membrane-based methods um, can also remove nanoparticles. 
so only thing is people right now i mean we have to explore with respect to keeping your uh, nanopart key removal in mind but generally uh, right uh, the focus is on uh, other side basically ions and only compounds so if you have a focus on nanopart key so whatever the existing method we have is like a matter of optimization of the parameters yeah. Okay, then there is a different question. Uh, one person want want to know what were the softwares that you use for the preparation of the flow chart. Uh, the the no those uh, charts were there. How the, those charts were prepared? Okay, I think, yeah, probably uh, this we use PowerPoint. I mean, okay, 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 directly PowerPoint. Yeah, I mean we just use PowerPoint and then uh, group and paste in the paint and bring it back. Okay. Okay. It's like very simple. I mean, I don't know. I mean, my students will come. Okay. Okay. Any more questions? We are also at the end of the time. We are at eleven, twelve, eleven thirty now. Yes. So, uh, yes. shall I uh, wind up? I mean, uh, Ananta. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, okay. 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 Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so we had a very uh, interactive and uh, interesting session in the morning. Uh, so, thank you, uh, Professor Arun Kumar, for that. So, in fact, uh, Professor Arun Kumar, uh, I know him uh, 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 ever since I joined for PhD in IIT Delhi. So, in fact, he joined IIT Delhi when I was doing PhD there, and uh, just a few days back, he became a full professor. So, congratulations to uh, Professor Arun Kumar for that. Uh, I always uh, like to listen to his classes. It was, uh, you know, always interesting. He used to always take classes like this. So, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Professor Arun. Uh, uh, on behalf of the Department of Civil Engineering, on behalf of the participants, and on behalf of the organizers, I thank you uh, for this very interesting session. So, thank yes. you. Yeah, thank so, you. I think only thing is I missed uh, coming to... Uh, coming yeah, to yeah definitely. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, and I think uh, I missed the chance to meet all the participants. Right. And uh, like in-person interaction is a better one. But uh, mm. yeah, I think yeah, it's good. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Okay, okay. So, uh, yeah, thank you. So, we will, uh, next session is at 11.30, so we'll have a short break. Uh, Ananda, please take over, so you can tell whatever. Yeah. Uh, sure. I hope the poll is going on, and uh, the question is, write your name was registered in Adult Portal. Kindly make it fast. Uh, I hope 140 participants has already completed the poll for uh, attendance, and 19 is a two. Uh, anyway, thank you. Thank you very much. And we are going ahead with our uh, second day of FTP. Uh, we will again start our section at 11.30 and link will be active. If you want to go out, you can go out and come. Link will be active. Okay. Thank you very much. I will be logging on. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. Uh, George, sir, I'm making you as the host now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, presenter option reminds with me uh, because the poll is Order going, is going on. on. Okay, okay, no problem. Maybe after five minutes you can take over. Okay, no problem. Uh, so technically I'm leaving. Yeah, you close the recording also, please. Yeah, yeah. No, no, recording option is with you now. Okay, 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 okay. Sir, you can close and you can restart again. Okay.